The question is often asked, when will UFO disclosure happen? The answer is, it has already happened. It happened in 2001 at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., where military, NASA, and intelligence agency whistleblowers testified to their involvement in the UFO cover-up and the back engineering of extraterrestrial technologies. It happened again in 2017 with the release of the film Unacknowledged, in anticipation of which the CIA and the FBI published millions of UFO documents on their websites. Despite all this, nothing has really changed. Life goes on as before, except there is a new narrative unfolding in the mainstream media, one that is designed to subvert true disclosure and extinguish the opportunity for transformation available to us through these revelations. Earlier this week, the New York Times and Politico revealed the existence of a secret government program to investigate UFO sightings. It was especially focused on encounters by members of the military, like this one experienced by a U.S. Navy pilot off the coast of California. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Look at that thing. It's rotating. Average people see UFOs, you know, on the news, right? All of a sudden, it's real. UFOs, we've been tracking them in the sky. And they go, okay, well, were the tinfoil hat people right? It took a long time for the mainstream media to finally admit that, yeah, you know, they are in fact real. Why did we wait that long? Why did we wait for the mainstream media to tell us before we finally believed, hey, this is actually happening? And the challenge is, if there's potentially multiple narratives, how do you decide which one to go with? Back in the 1990s, I was read into or briefed on a project that involved an interagency group that had the ability to disclose the ET presence in a way that would frighten everyone on Earth and convince the public that there was an alien threat, which is completely false. It's all a lie. And that this had been developed in the 50s and they had been developing the means and the psychological warfare to make that happen. So in the 1990s, I wrote a paper called When Disclosure Serves Secrecy. And what that means is there are two kinds of disclosures that might happen, a truthful one that is also a hopeful one, which is what I gave up my medical career to try to actuate and do. And then there's the one that is spun by the spinmeisters in Washington and at the Pentagon and CIA which runs like this. It's true, the UFOs are real. They are here as a threat. They're violating our airspace. They're a national security and a threat, and a threat to our sovereignty, I'm quoting. The purpose of the program, uh, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, was really designed to do just that. Um, from a national security perspective, identify those things that we see and try to ascertain and determine if that information is a potential threat to national security. And we knew this was going to happen because I had met with people who were in these classified projects who were on interagency committees that had everything set to roll this out and they were just waiting for the right time. The Soviet Union has ended. We have the global terrorism while it's still there. It's not like it was around 9-11. This is the next big thing that they want the public to be afraid of. When a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets. Or like if, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, it, and it's not that this isn't a genuine perception on their part, because they've been raised, their entire political and, and professional career has been designed to have this kind of artificial construct of this, there's this national airspace and nobody can come into the airspace unless we say so. And they, they've got this super control mechanism going. And they're right at this really important place right now where they're attempting to establish a kind of one world government you know that they've gotten the communication systems up the transportation systems up and they want to establish a planetary government and there's nothing that is going to motivate the creation of a one world government like the discovery of an ultimate other Ronald Reagan standing in front of the United Nations he said it right out perhaps we need some outside universal threat I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish 
if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. He was silly enough to say it. You know, that's part of his naivete. But the fact is, that is their agenda. Legendary civil rights attorney Daniel Sheehan has spent over 50 years fighting the national security state. The Pentagon Papers and the Iran-Contra scandals are but two of his many landmark cases before becoming a whistleblower and legal counsel for the Disclosure Project in 2001. It's helpful, of course, for them to say, oh, UFOs are real. That's quite helpful. We've been trying to get people to understand that now for the last 30 years. But it's all immediately wedded to this fact that they're this horrible threat. And so we had to come forward with a positive set of programs, a positive vision for this. And that's what I'm trying to help get the Vatican and the Jesuit order to become involved in, in putting forth you know, a discussion about the theological and philosophical challenges that this presents to us. But it's not a national security threat. You know, it's not a threat to our species. It's not a threat to our planet. It's a threat to our view as ourselves as the, the be all and end all that the entire universe was created as a stage on which to play out the human drama of one single species. You know, that ain't so, but let's, let's get used to it and let's figure out what the, what the new story is. What is the new story? It is a positive story. What is our role in it? We may not be the star, you know, of it, but we're a good supporting character. Uh, in, in the unfolding of our universe. And let's figure out what that story is. The success of Unacknowledged, which has been seen by hundreds of millions of people now. Have you not watched Unacknowledged? What is Unacknowledged? You gotta watch Unacknowledged. What is that one? Okay, you gotta watch Unacknowledged. What is it? You gotta watch Unacknowledged. Is that that Stephen Greer movie? Cause the reaction within the intelligence community of the United States. And so what the major media has begun to do is to cooperate with the intelligence community in reporting all this information out, but with this peculiar spin, very subliminal at this stage, that it's a threat. The project was called the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, run by an official named Luis Elizondo. I think this is a national security imperative. We have clear things that we do not understand how they work operating in areas that we can't control. One of my first cases uh, coming out of law school was for NBC to establish the right of journalists to protect their confidential news sources. I did the amicus briefs for the New York Times and the Washington Post and, and also for CBS and ABC. And it was at that time that I began to realize that there was this close working relationship between the board of editors of the New York Times and the national security community. That there's conversations going on all the time between the, the board of editors and the national security people. Uh, and we actually got an affidavit from Teddy Sorensen saying that, oh yes, the national security state, the CIA and everybody consult regularly with the New York Times to get them not to tell information about covert operations that we're engaged in. I was surprised uh, to find that out at that point I began to do an investigation about this as the lawyer for the Times, now and for NBC, and found out that there were 42 full-time Central Intelligence Agency, or NSA people, employed by the major national news media. And they had an entire project called Project Mockingbird. And that they were deeply embedded with the, with the major national news media. And they were constantly, from their point of view, safeguarding the information that was going to be allowed to get out. And it was quite clear that they viewed themselves as all part of the same basic fraternity. They all shared in the patriotic vision of the Central Intelligence Agency being able to go around the world. The thing we had the biggest challenge with on the Pentagon Papers case is they didn't want to reveal the fact that there was a massive assassination program going on. And it was being funded by heroin trafficking, you know, to keep it away from the congressional funding investigations, et cetera. I thought this was a terribly newsworthy thing to tell about, but it was beyond the pale. That was not to be talked about here. You know, you can talk about how bad the Vietnam War was and even the fact that they lied about the Bay of Tonkin incident, but not this. Even the Air Force Office of Special Investigations Officer Richard Doty admitted that he would bring bags of cash to national security editors in the major media to get their cooperation in this narrative. So every news uh, agency, uh, every television, radio station in the Albuquerque, Santa Fe area had our snitches in there. So we knew, and we paid them. We paid them good money. One of the, good, one of the reasons you get the people is you pay them. And uh, 
And that was controversial. That, that was somewhat controversial. Do you know of national media that have had Oh, them? yes, yes, yeah. I'm not gonna name them. What you have now is a concerted effort between mainstream media, social media platforms, and tech giants to say, let's gain control back of the narratives that we require to make sure that we can control how people think about certain topics. So now you have this fear driven. You have this, this tight little box of what the UFO and the extraterrestrial subject is really about, how it relates to military, government spending, weapons, all the sort of conversations that are very common in the mainstream that people are gonna to relate to that they, oh, okay, I can piece the typical dots together. Let me give you a great example. If you look at a lot of the disclosure project materials, which is beyond the scope of this film, we identified dozens of people who were at intercontinental ballistic missile, nuclear silos, nuclear weapons areas, who had had UFOs come in to those areas, surveilling them, but in some cases, rendering those missiles unlaunchable. Now, most of the men that were in those silos have said to me personally, they felt that these ETs were saying, please don't blow up this beautiful planet, but if you do, if you go to mutual assured destruction, the full launch of nuclear weapons globally, we can intercept a lot of them so that you don't go to a full extinction level event. They felt that it was actually a very hopeful thing that happened. Meanwhile, people came along, took the same data, the same cases, and spun it into a national security threat. One set of facts, two narratives, diametrically opposed, opposite. When I got involved in uh, the issue of the UFO issue and the ET issue, uh, starting in 1977 with, with President Carter, I realized that the work that I was doing was characterized by the national security state as a target for counterintelligence activities. When I see this thing happening with this To The Stars Academy, uh, where they suddenly appear on the front page of the New York Times, and the CNN all of a sudden wants to talk with them, and they're on MSNBC and all this kind of stuff, uh, I immediately kind of uh, realized, wait a second, this is part of what I've been worried about coming out, because they were constantly spinning this story, that this is a threat. My name is Tom DeLong. Um, a lot of people know me uh, from my band, Blink-182. I started that band when I was 16. Through a series of meetings, I was soon connected to a large group of U.S. government officials from the CIA, the Department of Defense, and Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. These guys were the ones involved in the secretive U.S. government programs that dealt with these subjects. What's happening is the To The Stars Academy people were all, you know, Jim Simi Van, who's there, you know, the, the chief of covert operations domestic for CIA, which in and of itself is totally against the law. You know, the National Security Act of 1947 completely, clearly, and unequivocally prohibits any kind of covert operations stateside. Uh, but here, that's who he is. Uh, and there he is there. And you got the guys from the DIA and the Defense Department and Hal put off and stuff. And they're, they're all there. And, and what, what they're doing is they're, they're putting this intense spin. Every single thing they talk about all has this kind of gestalt to it that this is a threat. And it very well could be a threat. Uh, it's a threat to our national security. It's a threat to our airspace. Uh, it's a threat to our sovereignty. It's, it's what it is, it's a threat to our dominion over our own planet. And of course, they think that's their job. <laughs> our job is to assert full spectrum dominance over the entire planet. We actually have the documents from the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Planning Guidance document, where they said that right at the end of the, right at the dissolution of the Soviet Union, said, oh, We've got to not cut back on our military spending. We have to increase it so we can establish full spectrum dominance over the planet. And so you know what their agenda is, the national security state. It's not for the defense of our sovereignty. The danger of this, of course, is that this is exactly what all the fascistic demagogues do to an innocent target, whether it be Jews in Germany or African Americans in this country. They will create sort of a, a boogeyman effect to try to get people mobilized against it. You're one ugly motherfucker. And as one member of a royal family told me, we need to do things so that the public will accept in blood and treasure the sacrifices needed to have an interplanetary war, I'm quoting. Bombshell CIA documents, previously published by the Disclosure Project, reveal a decades-long psychological warfare campaign 
to cultivate a culture of fear towards extraterrestrials. And it's interesting that Hollywood and uh, you know the clandestine services are both spend most of their time convincing people that something that's not true is in fact true. I think probably Hollywood is full of CIA agents, and we just don't know it. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised at all to discover that you know this was extremely common. Intelligence assets within Hollywood have made billions of dollars popularizing the narrative that humanity's first encounter with ETs will be a devastating bloodbath.